Welcome back, brothers and sisters. This is Seed Wars number 21, and we're going to pick it up pretty much where we left off on the last one. Quick review. Last chapter, we were looking at the Anakims, also pronounced Anaki, and we're just trying to connect them to the Anunnaki. And if you recall, Zechariah Sitchin, probably the most famous man who's really um, unveiled this Anunnaki theory, he says that they uh, were an extraterrestrial race that came from a hypothetical planet known as Nibiru, or Planet X, and that that planet comes into our solar system every 3,600 years, and that the last time it came into our solar system, these extraterrestrials came down from Nibiru onto planet Earth, and they genetically engineered modern day humans by crossbreeding themselves with Homo erectus Neanderthal man. So in other words, they took their own DNA, spliced it together with the primitive primates of Earth, and that's what gave those primates a boost, if you will, a leg up so that they could become Homo sapiens that we are today. And that they did this in order to create a slave race that they can control going forward. And that they're still here today controlling world governments and controlling the direction of humanity. Now, I think there's a lot of truths here. I just think that the uh, starting point's a little off. The Bible says that the fallen angels, the sons of God, the B'nai Ah Elohim, came down to earth and that they saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took them wives and slept with them and created the nephilim which are the giants the men of renown the men of old and so you know the argument is are they really is it are we dealing with a spiritual situation where we're dealing with satan the demonic realm and the fallen angels or are we really dealing with more of a science technological situation where we're dealing with extraterrestrial beings, UFOs coming down from alternate planets? Now, I've said in the past that um, the second heaven is connected to outer space. And when you study both biblical and occult cosmology, you find that every celestial body has a an angelic entity associated with it. And it's interesting that the word Nephilim comes from the word Nephal, and the word Nephal actually derives from the giant constellation in the sky of the name Orion. In other words, it's thought that these beings fell from that giant constellation in the sky. So the fallen angels who live throughout the cosmos um, they can manifest in our four-dimensional time space from a higher dimensional realm and potentially from other planets. We don't understand that spirit realm. We don't, we don't understand that cosmology. But we don't have to separate them out from extraterrestrials. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both. That they are the extraterrestrials. That, that they... And, and, we know that they're full of wisdom. We know that they had the eternal secrets of heaven, according to Enoch. And those eternal secrets include technology. For all I know, they came down, those angels came down 5,000 years ago in sophisticated UFO crafts. They didn't have to necessarily fly down to the planet with their angel wings. They're using technology. They, they, they have... Uh, connections to all of that they were they were here in the beginning um, during the creation event they understand far more than we do and so you know and we see in the book of Enoch that they were revealing technology they they were teaching mankind about everything from the earth to the plants to the zodiac and the movement of the celestial bodies how could they teach mankind about the rotation of the planets and the moon and the sun and the summer and winter solstice, how could they do that unless they were intimately aware 
of the exact patterns of those planets. That means they've been up there in space for God knows how long, that they're, they're acquainted with all that. So they, they know everything about cosmology and the movement of planets. And, um, you know, they probably do tote around in, in, in some kind of extraterrestrial craft. So that's not out, you know, that doesn't have to be outside of our biblical paradigm. Now, we know that these Anaki are a giant Nephilim race that was living in the promised land in, in Canaan in the days of Moses. When Moses was getting ready to cross over the Jordan River and head into the promised land, he sent out some spies. And they went and checked things out and they discovered that, sure enough, the sons of Anak were living in the land. And they were anticipating this because the sons of Anak were infamous. As it says in Genesis 6, they were men of renown. That means that they had a mythological and legendary status about them. The same way that today we could say that Hercules is a, is a man of renown. Everybody on this planet, I don't care if you're from Australia or Africa Odds are you travel around the world today, most people have heard of Hercules, the demigod, half human, half god, according to Greek mythology. He's a large man with supernatural you know, strength and powers. He's not fully human, but he looks human. And um, he's a giant, technically speaking, muscular, and he's uh, very famous. He's a, he's a man of renown. So he's just a he's just an example of what I'm trying to display that this these who were the sons of Anak. <clears throat> and these they come from a specific genealogy. And I would submit to you that it's a royal bloodline. That as we start looking in the book of Joshua and we see that Joshua has been faced with having to root out all of these kings, that he goes through and systematically wipes out the 33 Nephilim kings, we begin to realize that. It's the seed of the serpent that brings in the concept of bloodlines and royalty. They're the ones who have the kings and the queens. They're the ones who start the monar monarchies and the feudal systems. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to potentiate their serpent seed because keep in mind, they have human DNA as well, right? They're, they're, they're hybrids. They're, they're partly angelic and partly human. And their desire is to concentrate those genes from the angels and, and continue to perfect that. And so over time, we have these bloodlines where the kings and the queens only marry the kings and the queens from the other neighboring bloodlines. And we're seeing different concentrations of Nephilim genes and Nephilim blood being produced. And this leads to the royal bloodlines. The, the ancient blue bloods, these are the ones who run the world. And over millennia, the system has evolved into these royal bloodlines of the Illuminati. And, you know, most people believe that they do have some reptilian DNA within them, even though they manifest and present themselves in fully human form. And we see that throughout the Old Testament. There's different scenarios in the Old Testament where you couldn't always discern the Nephilim from the neighboring people. They don't always have to be giants the way that they used to be. Um, you know, before the flood, it was real easy. You had these great big, huge monsters walking around. But things have changed over time. And I would say that that is also partially due to microevolution, that you know, I don't, I don't subscribe to macroevolution in that I don't believe that single cells became multiple cells and then eventually fish and then animals and then monkeys and then humans. Um, I don't believe in that at all. I, I subscribe to the creation event that God created everything in its own image, in its own likeness, after its own kind, and so on and so forth. But we do clearly see microevolution where there's small, subtle changes over time with species we even see that in human beings. If you go back and look at bodybuilders in the 1930s and 40s, as they transcend all the way up even in the 60s and 70s with Arnold Schwarzenegger and then continue to see him today, 
you see a dramatic change in the physiques and the structure of men and women who were, you know, working out in, in, in fitness 80 years ago versus today. Um, that's called microevolution, little subtle changes that, that adapt over time. And so we clearly see this with the Nephilim, as we as in demonstrated over here in the chart on the right. I mean, they started off huge and they got smaller. And now we're looking at average men to this day who still have traces of fallen Nephilim DNA within them. Now, it's interesting, on the last lecture, one of the listeners had responded that uh, Zechariah Sitchin was a 33rd degree Freemason. And I haven't really had time to vet that out, but I find that fascinating because that would make a lot of sense. Um, he's really the, the most famous person for pushing this theory and, and really getting it to become part of the New Age ideology. And if he was a 33rd degree Freemason, that would makes a lot of sense to me because the Masons at that level, at the higher levels, are all into the occult. They've all taken the Luciferian initiation. And so they're all they're all working through a different spirit that's at work on this planet. They've opened the door to the second heaven. They've let the enemy in and they've let the demonic manifestations come in. And they begin, it's the demons who inspire all of these concepts. We've seen that time and time again as we've went through the lectures, you know, whether we're dealing with Scientology or whether we're dealing with some of these prolific writers um, who wrote books like Childhood's End or, you know, they, they were all into the occult. Whether we're dealing with J.R.R. Tolkien who did The Lord of the Rings, as you go back and you look at all of them, it's always the same story. They were into the occult, they were messing around with stuff they shouldn't have been messing around with, and they were having paranormal and supernatural experiences, and they were receiving inspiration from the spirit realm. And then they just, they were prompted to do these things. And what that reveals is, it reveals the mind of the spirit realm. This, the spirit realm wants these things manifested to humanity. So yes, they're going to work through Zechariah Sitchin and through his Masonic Babylonian mystery religion that he you know, participated in. And in doing so, they can manipulate and inspire and work through these people to produce the theories and the ideologies that are very quickly gaining popularity. You say, well, why would they, you know, why would they be working through these men why would they work through the Nazis to produce a lot of the UFO technology and so on and so forth? Well, obviously for a reason. There's a reason why the demons are working through the men and giving them all of this propaganda, if you want to call it. And that reason is clear. There's going to be a great deception in the last days. God's going to allow the, the great delusion to come upon humanity. And man's going to have to pick. Does he want God? Or does he want his extraterrestrials and to become transhuman and to become like God? And, you know, it's, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a very interesting situation as it all begins to manifest. Most people, if you tell them that there's this extraterrestrial delusion that's on on the on the forefront, I mean, they just roll their eyes. They're they're. they're most people, that's not even within their worldview or paradigm. And so um, when it happens, it's going to really capture the minds and the hearts of the entire planet. And it's going to, the way it's going to be rolled out is it's going to be done so in such a way that it's really going to just boggle the minds of, of, of all of humanity. And it's going to greatly challenge all of the superstitious doctrines of the old age. And most people are going to begin rejecting the scripture and everything to do with yesteryear. And they're going to want to begin to adopt the new age paradigm that the extraterrestrials are going to offer for us to be able to advance our race and become you know, who we've been destined to, to become according to their uh, beliefs.
So for now, we're going to continue to push forward looking at some of the Old Testament scripture, which is very difficult to interpret because we have a lot of uh, very vague um, details that, you know, that it, it's hard to line up. And, you know, I get a lot of responses and a lot of people busting on me that I'm, you know, um, coming up with all kinds of ridiculous ideas. But I mean, there's not exactly a tremendous amount of material here. We have a couple of texts that are thousands of years old to work with. Um, so, you know, we're doing the best that we can. And so on that note, we'll, we'll uh, move on. So in the Bible, the general, the generalization of these entities is that they're all Nephilim. That's a very broad category. Kind of like you could say, you know, everybody in the United States are Americans. But then, you know, we have different groups of people in America. We have people who live on the East and West Coast. We have people from each state. You have Texans and Nevadans and Californians. Those Texans and Nevadans and Californians are all still Americans. But we're getting more specific about where they live, so on and so forth. Well, that's how it is with the Nephilim. Uh, they're also, in Genesis 6, referred to as the Gibberim, the mighty men of old. The, and so Nephilim and Gibberim sort of go hand in hand. We're told after the flood that um, in the Tower of Babel, that Nimrod became a Gibberim. And so there's a lot of interesting studies out there revealing how he was becoming a Nephilim. And that's has to do with DNA as well, and that's complicated. But So you've got these Nephilim or Gibberim, and then after the flood, they, they really come back through the nation of uh, Canaan, or that's um, Noah's grandson. And we're going to get into that study, and that, that's a very interesting study. We know that after the flood, Noah is the patriarch who repopulates the earth. Him, his wife, and their three boys and their wives. And one of his boys, Ham, ends up not being such a nice guy. And he does some very disturbing things to his family, which result in the birth of Canaan. In Canaan is Noah's grandson, and he has the Nephilim strain, the Nephilim DNA uh, genetic strain within his genome, which is quite fascinating. And we'll have to look at the physiology of that here very soon and, and how that came to be. But either way, Canaan, you know, it says in the scripture, Noah curses Canaan, cursed be Canaan. And sure enough, the curse is true because Canaan gives rise to the Canaanites. And every single one of those Canaanites have Nephilim giant blood in them. They, they, they all become the giants of the Old Testament. The Jebusites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Amorites and so on and so forth. And so... What makes it complicated is when you start getting into all the terminology, you know, if, if you were talking to someone from uh, Russia and they really knew nothing about America and you started talking very quickly about, well, it could be called America. It's also called the United States. Those are two different names. It means the same thing. And then you could start talking about, you know, Californians and Texans. And then you could even take it a step further, you, you know, go to certain cities you know, people from New Yorkers, that's a city within a state. So that's the same thing with this Nephilim. We have all these different branches. We have the Anakims and the Raphaims and the Amims and the Zuzims and the Horims. And all that has to do with is the different words that the different nations came up for them. You know, the the, the Moabites, maybe you called them the Amims, and the Edomites might have called them the Zuzims. And don't quote me on that. I'm just I'm using that as an example. And then later, it gets even more complex because they fall under a new title. 
they're not really called the Nephilim anymore. They're called the Canaanites. Well, the Canaanites are Nephilim, but there's been a name change. Just the same way that Lucifer took on a name change to become Satan, the Nephilim in the Old Testament are now called the Canaanites. And there's specific ones, and, and we'll, we'll learn about them as we go forward. But the take-home point is that they all have the contaminated fallen angel um, DNA, and they all are part of the seed of the serpent that was described back before the flood. You know, in Genesis 3, we have the seed of the woman who's in a perpetual battle with the seed of the serpent. And the, the seed of the serpent is going to bruise the Messiah's heel while the seed of the woman through the Messiah is going to crush the serpent's head. And so all of these Canaanites are eventually going to give rise to the ones who would bruise the Messiah's heel. Well, who are they? Who are the ones that bruise the Messiah's heel? That's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so as the lectures go forward, we're going to have to work extra hard to try and demonstrate that the seed of the serpent goes all the way throughout the Old Testament and manifests right up into the religious leaders of Judaism and are the ones who sent Jesus to the cross. And that's, that's for a, another lecture. So let's take a look at a couple verses in Deuteronomy. The Amims dwelt there in times past, a people great and many and tall, as the Anakims, which also were accounted as giants. There it is. They're also giants as the Anakims were, but the Moabites called them Amims. Now the word Amim actually means terror. That's what these people's names mean, terrors. So they're a very close cousin, if you will, of the Anakims. A great people, many and tall, like the Anakims, they come from the giants, but they're called Amims. In Genesis 14, shortly after the flood, we see, And in the fourteenth year came Shedelamor and the kings that were with him, and he smote the Raphaims in a place called Ashtaroth Karnain. And there the Zuzims were in Ham and the Amims in Ashtaroth Karnain. Now, obviously, the Old Testament, it gets difficult. These words get difficult. But you've just got to take your time and, and go through it because, you know, Moses wrote Genesis. He put these details in there for a reason. There's a story here. There's a backstory that we need to get to. So we're talking about the Battle of the Kings back in Genesis. Just because these uh, Nephilim tribes... Just because they're all um, kin to one another doesn't mean they like each other. In fact, it's just the opposite. They're all a bunch of warlords. Every one of these tribes are warring tribes. And, you know, they have no problem turning on each other any more than they do turning on regular men. They have these hybrid abominable spirits these inside of them. The book of Enoch said that when the flood came and it destroyed all the Nephilim, that it released all of their disembodied demonic spirits onto the earth. So we know that these entities have these demonic spirits inside of them. They are a hybrid vessel for a demonic spirit. And demonic spirits don't care any more about their own family than they do any, anybody else. So in this time, you're dealing with these different warring tribes, these heathen nations that are have no problem turning against each other. That's why when you read about them, it always says that their cities were so great. They were so walled. They had the biggest fences. And you know, when you look those words up, these big walled cities imply that they're these great, big, huge fortresses. 
well, why would they need their cities to be so heavily walled all the way up to the heavens? And the answer is, is because the neighboring tribe at any given moment would come over and smash them into pieces and take take their stuff. So they they built these big fortresses, and all of these kings were warmongers. And in this particular instance, we have Shedole, Shedor Lamor, who's one of the Nephilim kings. And he's going to war with the neighboring Raphaims. Now, the Raphaims are another brand of giants. In particular, we know about King Og of Bashan, who's an Amorite. He, we're told that he is a Raphaim. So, you know, we have, we're seeing these different cousins, if you will. Now, Moses also clarifies where the war transpired. It was in a city called Ashtaroth Karnaim. You may say, big deal. What does that got to do with anything? Well, Ashtaroth is named after the female goddess Ashtaroth, also known as Astartes. She is the goddess, the Canaanite goddess of sexuality and fertility and love and war. And when you look the word up, it's age 6252, Astarot, A-S-T-A-R-O-T. Notice the, the root of that word, star. It's where we get the word star to this day. And so they were worshiping Astaroth. And she is the female consort to Baal, and Moloch. And if you recall, they are the, the primary Canaanite gods of the Old Testament. Baal, or it's actually pronounced Baal, Baal, and Moloch translates as Lord and King. So these were the, the sun and, and moon gods that the Canaanites worshipped. And they did it in this city, Ashtaroth Karname. Now, Ashtaroth Karname means the city of the crescent moons or the double horns. And that's going to become very relevant as we proceed forward. So, as you can see, we've got all these little additional details. You know, nothing is, there is no frivolous details. There's, everything has a meaning, everything has an understanding. Um, it says here that not only did Shedel Amor kill the Raphaims, but he also killed the Zuzims and the Emims. Now, the Zuzims were a different branch of Nephilim, and that word means roving creatures. That's the exact translation. If you're a Zuzim, in the Old Testament, you are a roving creature. Now, does that sound like a human being to you? Or what about the ones we looked at here a minute ago? The the um, the terrors, the emims, which translates as terrors, because they obviously cause great fear in those who cross their paths. And so, and then we're told also that um, the Amims were in Ashtaroth Karnain. So, all of these Nephilim tribes, they worship the stars and the moon and the sun. They're into astrology. They're pagans. We know that goes back all the way before the flood. It's the fallen angels who even introduced that idea. There was never a time where man wanted to worship the stars until... The fallen angels introduced that concept to human beings. Same with the metals. They learned how to make all the little idols and the gold idols and everything because of the fallen angels. So now they've got them worshiping these gods and goddesses up in the sky, and they're naming cities after them. Ashtaroth Karname is one of the major worship centers for this female goddess. Now, when you get to studying her, Astarte or Ashtaroth, 
you find that she's associated with the planet Venus. Which is interesting because Lucifer is also associated with the planet Venus. In fact, Lucifer is called the morning star in the Bible, and it's in reference to Venus. And Astarte is called the evening star in, in representation of Venus. Venus, the planet Venus, can be seen at dusk and dawn with the waxing and the waning of the sun because the light is just right to be able to pick out that planet. So Venus is called the morning and evening star, and that is represented by Lucifer, Baal, and Ashtaroth. And she has many Greek equivalents, um, or excuse me, many other names depending on what society we're dealing with. So in the, in the Phoenician Canaanite language, it's Astarte. If you move into the Greek, we're dealing with Aphrodite, the goddess of love and war. In the Roman iconography, they also called her Venus. Sometimes they called her Diana. In Babylon, they called her Ishtar or Semiramis. In Egypt, Astarte was known as Isis, the mother of Horus. In Hinduism, they refer to her as Kali, the female god of love and war. So every culture has this same god. They just use a different name because they obviously speak with a different language. And she's been passed down from culture to culture to culture. Now what's really interesting is that her symbol is a star within a circle. And that's called a pentagram. We've all drawn stars before. You can draw a five-pointed star quite easily on a piece of paper like that, put it inside of a circle, and you now have a pentagram. That's known as the star, the pentagram of Astarte, the goddess of Venus. And we see different images down here. Here's a pentagram of Astarte. You'll notice that it has the crescent moon, which makes the double horns on it. You look over here to the image of the left, you see the double horns. Over on the right, we see the cycle of the moon. And it's interesting, there's something called an Astarte moon, which we see down here below. They've been calling it that for millennia. Where do you think they got the notion to call it that? Obviously goes back to the Old Testament. They worshiped Astarte. She's the goddess of Venus. She's also the, the moon goddess, and they worshipped her at night, and so they paid particular attention to the, the moon and its, its movements, and we know where they learned that from. They learned that these Nephilim tribes learned that from their, their fallen angel kin who had come down in Genesis 6 and taught this secret to mankind. And uh, that's why we see here on the image uh, a, a pentagram inside of a circle. So, basically to summarize, we've got the fallen angels who come down and they mix their DNA with the humans. And that creates hybrids. Now these hybrids are called the Nephilim. And they're the children of the fallen angels. you got to understand that. These Nephilim tribes that would go on to be the Canaanites and the Anakims, and the Zuzims, and the Amims, and so on and so forth, those are the fallen angels' illegitimate children. And so, yes, they work through them, they speak to them demonically, they coordinate things with them. So is it any wonder that these uh, demonic hybrids are worshiping their parents in the sky, who are these angels that represent all these celestial bodies, like the moon and the sun? No. No, that's not a coincidence at all. And we're seeing here that these Anakims are worshiping Astaroth, like we just reviewed. Well, you'll never see Astaroth mentioned outside of Baal and Moloch. They all go together, like peanut butter and jelly. Baal's the male consort, and Astaroth is the female consort. For example, 1 Kings 11. King Solomon went after Astaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, or Moloch, 
the abomination of the Ammonites. Same thing in Judges. They forsook the Lord our God and they served Baal and Ashtaroth. See how they always go together? Baal and Ashtaroth. One's the female god of the moon, the other's the male sun god. So we're going to take a look at them in a minute. Now, since we just brought up Solomon, we've looked at him lots of times in the past. He started out good under David, but then those, you know, the women were able to get to him. He he married the daughter of Pharaoh, the Egyptian daughter's Pharaoh's daughter. And that was the beginning of the end because a little leaven ruins the whole batch. And you start rubbing elbows with the wrong people. And guess what? You get sucked into their world. And that's what happened to Solomon. He started hanging out with the wrong people. And next thing you know, he's marrying these pagan uh, royal bloodlines. And then sure enough, he goes full blow into idolatry, begins to set up uh, altars to Ashtaroth and Moloch and Baal, and that's where child sacrifice is instituted into the nation of Israel. Because as we'll learn shortly, that's what you need to do to make Baal and Moloch happy. They require human sacrifice, preferably child sacrifice. So we're just dealing with the same old satanic garbage that we have today. The, the bloodlines of the Illuminati and the elite that are running the world now are also doing human sacrifice very much like they did three, four, five thousand years ago to the same gods and the same angels. Nothing's changed. And so in Jeremiah 7, we see God says, Therefore, do not pray for these people, nor lift up a cry or a prayer for them. Don't even make intercession to me on their behalf, for I will not hear you. He's talking about the Israelites, by the way. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather the wood and the father kindles the fire. The women knead the dough and they make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to the other gods to provoke me to anger. So this is pretty interesting. I mean, God's saying, look, don't even pray for these people. Don't even intercede on their behalf. They're, they're so far gone now that I'm, I won't even hear your prayer. And notice how the whole family's involved. You know, the children are running out gathering the wood and the father's lighting the fire and the women are kneading the dough to make the, the cakes that go to the queen of heaven. The queen of heaven is... Astarte, Ashtaroth. They call her the queen of the heaven because they're looking up into the heavens when they worship her. She's the moon god, or the moon goddess, should I say. So we have lots of renditions of this in the Old Testament. Now in the book of Amos, we add another layer to it. But you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch in Kion, your images, the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. We're going to take a closer look at this. This is really interesting. This is what happens to the Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai when Moses goes up to receive the tablets. I mean, at this point, the Israelites haven't even been around the Canaanites. They just literally crossed over the Jordan River and came into, the, came into the Promised Land. And the first place they go is up to Mount Sinai. But they have just spent 400 years in Egypt. And when you study the Egyptians, it becomes evident that they were also part of the seed of the serpent. They were also... Um, star worshipers and they also worshiped uh, the sun the moon and the other planets and we see that being brought out here in Acts 7 when Stephen is is being persecuted he's the first martyr in the New Testament he's standing there before the Sanhedrin he's trying to explain to them how Jesus was the fulfillment of all of the prophecies and Saul of Tarsus, before his conversion to Paul, 
is going to be responsible for leading to Stephen's death. And Stephen gives this long sermon about the history of our fathers. And he starts to speak about the days when Moses came into the promised land and he went up to receive the tablets. And while he was up there, Aaron and all of the Hebrews down below got bored. And he says, then God turned and he gave them up to worship the host of heaven. Yea, they took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of their god Rimphan, figures which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. And so when we look at these prophecies, it says here that God gave him over to worship the hosts of heaven. What is a host of heaven? It's the stars. It's the celestial bodies. The word host actually means stratia. It's where we get the word stratosphere. And when it says that they took up the tabernacle of Moloch. A tabernacle is a tent. And so they built a tent. And inside of that tent, they made an altar or an image of Moloch, which is this god Rimphan and this god Kyun. Both of those words in the Strong's Concordance means the star of Saturn, the planet of Saturn. So we know that they were worshiping Saturn, which, you know, studies reveal is Satan. And it's interesting that they made a star of the planet Saturn. We'll take a wild guess what the star was that they made. It is the five pointed and six pointed star, the pentagram and the hexagram. That's the star of Moloch or Rimphan or the star of Baal. It's all the same. And we see that down here in the bottom left. This is a talisman of Saturn. It goes back way deep into the Dark Ages. And it, it, talismans involve astrology and the zodiac. What do you notice about it? On the back side, it has a five pointed star on the side of a circle. And on the front, it has a six pointed star inside of a circle with an image of a bull with horns that has to do with the double horns that we just reviewed the the, the double horns that we see on Baal, Moloch and Astra. In fact, here's an image of Baal right here. What do you notice about him? He's a hybrid. He's half man, half bull with horns. This is where the Greeks got the idea of the Minotaur. And this hybrid represents the hybrids before and after the flood. This is where the uh, idea of the goat with the horns fits into the five-pointed star, the goat of Mendes. So there's many different variations of it. But the main important point to see here is that they were using the sacred geometry back then. The five and six-pointed stars inside of the circles were the talismans that they were using to worship the stars. We know that while Moses was up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, Aaron and the rest of them are down there collecting all the gold earrings and the bracelets from all of the Hebrews so that they can make a large metal cast with the image of a bull. And they made a big golden calf. And all of the renditions of the golden calf always look the same. It's up on top of a big altar, and it shows the two horns with the planet in between. That represents the double horns of the crescent moon that we see on Astarte, like we saw in the preceding image. The pentagram of, of Astarte shows the exact same image. So they were worshiping Baal, Moloch, and Astarte using the five and six pointed star. And that's, that's called a hexagram. It's used in witchcraft. And eventually that makes its way over to Solomon. And we've proven right here, without a shadow of a doubt, that back in Moses' day, way before David and Solomon ever come onto the scene, they're worshiping Moloch and Baal and Saturn. And I'm showing you the talisman of Saturn. And it has the five and six pointed star with the bull. So that's undeniable. Now, 
Fast forward hundreds and hundreds of years later, when King Solomon goes after Ashtaroth and Milcom and Moloch and Baal and begins to build altars to them, he learns about this same star, the star of Rimphan, the star of Kuhn. And he, be, he begins to build altars, and that becomes his official seal. In fact, he puts that on his signet ring, and that's what he signs all of his documents for. And that becomes the most, that's when it really becomes world famous, because it's now known as the Seal of Solomon, and it's used throughout witchcraft and, and, and going forward. And then later it becomes the official adopted symbol of Baron Rothschild. And Rothschild is the one who chooses to put it on the Israeli flag, and they name it the Star of David, and people begin to worship. You know, I see Christians wearing the Star of David around their neck, and I think, my goodness, if they just knew the 5,000 years of history of that symbol, that symbol represents human sacrifice, blood sacrifice to the fallen angels and the Nephilim. That's why Adolf Hitler made quite sure that all the Jews in the concentration camps had that symbol on their chest. Go back and look at all the images and all of the photography. You'll see the, quote, Star of David all over the place. You think that if, if that was really a, a benevolent symbol to honor the Jews, that Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler would put it all over the buildings and all over their, their, their clothes before they killed them? No, they wouldn't do that to honor the Jews. They hated the Jews. They thought that they were subhuman. They thought that they were some kind of inhumane pig race, as Adolf Hitler put it. So they wouldn't do anything to honor them. Now, the reason that they slapped those six-pointed stars up everywhere is because they knew that that is the symbol for sacrifice to the gods. And so it was a very appropriate symbol to put on them before they gassed them in the chambers and then pitched their bodies in the ovens to burn them. The word Holocaust actually translates as burnt offering. That was a nothing more than a giant satanic ritual to these fallen angels and demons that were controlling the leaders of Germany at the time. And so when, when people are, are sending um, or when they're, when they're putting those symbols up, they don't understand the power of the symbol. Remember what Theurgy states. Theurgy says that the symbol is a direct connection and, it, and it's an archetype, or excuse me, it's a direct connection to the archetype that it represents. That means that it's a charged symbol, there's demonic power, it's a doorway that's why the six-pointed star has six points, six mini triangles, six sides. It's a geometric uh, 666. You know, so so when we when we look at that throughout history, it becomes evident that that is a very powerful symbol that's been used for a long time. I mean, right here you can see the pentagram of Astarte, and it has the moon in the center with the double horns, the crescent moon that makes the two horns. What do you see over here in this rendition when they're worshiping Baal and Moloch and Ashtaroth back in at the base of Mount Sinai? You see a golden calf with the double horns and the moon. It's the same symbol. And what's fascinating is Moses has just received the law. God knows what's going on. He knows about the fallen angels and all of these eternal secrets as they revealed. And now mankind is obsessed with putting together the gold statues and worshiping the stars in the sky. The fallen angels are the ones who introduced all of that. So naturally, God has to give out, lay out some rules like, hey, if I'm going to pick out my chosen people and try and make them holy and, and so that they're not perverted like the rest of the planet, I'm going to have to give them some very specific rules that negate what these stinking angels did, you know, back before the flood. So 
You're going to only worship one God. And number two, you're not going to have any other idols. And number three, you're not going to build any graven images. You know, all of, all of those rules are laid down as a defense, if you will, to the idolatry that's going on literally at that moment. While Moses is on the mountain for 40 days, the Hebrews are down there building golden calves and tabernacles and, and making images of five and six pointed stars, which are likenesses of Saturn and Venus and the sun and so on and so forth. And they're doing demonic rituals and sacrificing animals to their gods. So yes, God has to lay out the Ten Commandments and bring out the Levitical laws. Don't sleep with your mother. Don't drink blood. Don't have ancestral relationships. I mean, the world up until this point has just been nothing but chaos. Before the flood, we see the contamination of the Nephilim and all of the wickedness, so much so that God has to destroy the whole planet. And then right again, soon as Noah starts rebuilding, guess what? The seed of the serpent get busy immediately through Ham and Canaan and the Canaanites. And once again, the Tower of Babel and all the wickedness that's happening in Babylon. And so, you know, God has to try and, and, and protect his particular people and give them some rules and give them some laws. We see here that the pyramid pointing down and the pyramid pointing up represents the as above, so below maxim that's throughout all of Freemasonry, throughout all of uh, her Hermeticism, the Jew and also the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. We see it in Islamic mysticism. It's what all of witchcraft and sorcery and mysticism are based on. And it actually represents the four elements, fire, wind, water, and earth, as we see demonstrated over here on this symbol. The pyramid pointing up is fire and, and wind, and the pyramid pointing down is earth and water, or it may be the reverse. It also represents uh, the yin and the yang, the you know the, the opposites, masculine versus feminine, up versus down, left versus right, the law of reversal. There's many different layers to it. But it's always been used for witchcraft. We see here that the star formed by the two opposite triangles provides universal protection for anyone who wears it in India. The second person in the Hindu trinity, Vishnu, who is represented by the sun god. The sun is often placed in the middle of the two triangles, creating a powerful talisman that symbolizes all seven planets known to the ancient world. The six points of the triangle represent Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, Mercury, and the moon. Nothing was believed impossible for those who possessed the power of it, and they had the power over all the spirits because this symbol represented strong psychic force. And what do they call it? The Seal of Solomon. And if anybody denies that the Star of David, which is an inaccurate name, is the Seal of Solomon, they just need to go back into many texts going back into the Renaissance era. All of the, uh, from, from, from um, Queen Elizabeth's uh, sorcerer, um, John Dee, going all the way up through um, Eliphas Levi, Aleister Crowley, they've all used the seal of Solomon and the six-pointed star and the sacred geometry to do the witchcraft. And specifically, it has to do with the, the human sacrifice, which we'll look at here very soon. Um, Whenever you go back in the Bible and you read about the sacrifices to Baal and Moloch, its child sacrifice usually took place in the Valley of Hinnon, which Jesus actually refers to in the New Testament. When he tells the, the seed of the serpent, when he tells the Pharisees and the Sadducees that 
you generation of vipers, how are you going to escape the damnation of hell? The word hell is Gienna, and it translates as the Valley of Hinnom, where the Canaanite gods had child sacrifice performed by putting them inside of the brazen bull. And I think we'll save that for the next lecture. These lectures are getting pretty heavy, and, um, and that's enough for today, and we'll pick it up where we left off on the next one. So Godspeed, and we'll see you on the next one.